My name is Terry Kylo, and this is what I'm learning about racism. I know I have much more to learn. Racism is both a construct and a reality. The construct is the fiction that human beings can be categorized by our skin color. Toni Morrison said, there is no such thing as race, none. There's just a human race, scientifically, anthropologically. Racism is a construct, a social construct, and it has benefits. Money can be made off of it. People who don't like themselves can feel better because of it. It can describe certain kinds of behavior that are wrong or misleading, so it has a social function, racism. The reality is that for over half a millennium, on this continent, the social construct of racism has created what Isabel Wilkerson has described as a caste system based on the color of our skin. This caste system, which she describes in her book Caste, functions to determine our status and the opportunities we have and where we belong. It benefits some, harms some, but also in many ways has negative effects on everyone. For more on this, see The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. Wilkerson's research reveals that caste systems have eight pillars that keep them in place. Divine will, heritability, endogamy, that is marriage within our caste, purity and pollution, occupational hierarchy, dehumanization and stigma, terror and cruelty, and lastly, the inherent superiority of classes. We encourage you to read her book and or watch some interviews with her about this. The other question is where racism starts. Many people assume that racism starts with biases within people and then moves out from there. If people would just be nice, we would not have racism, some say. In response to this theory, people engage in a strategy that focuses only on changing these biases, a strategy that focuses on internal attitudes and feelings. Merely changing our hearts and not working to dismantle the caste system, a system of oppression, is completely inadequate to the problem. It is a good start, but only a start. Ibram X. Kendi, in his book Stamp from the Beginning, proposes a different theory about how racism gets started. He says it starts with economic, political, and cultural self-interests. These are expressed in racially discriminatory policies. Racist ideas are then promoted that justify these policies and divide people against each other. These ideas create ignorance and hate in people and between groups that then keeps the unjust system as it is. The caste system based on race is expressed in four locations of human experience. Intrapersonal, that is, internalized privilege or oppression. Interpersonal, expressions of dominance and submission between people. Institutional, the written and unwritten rules of who gets a loan, a business, or a promotion at work. Structural, national narratives, what appears to be common sense, and laws that impact everyone. If we are serious about anti-racism, we must do work in each of these four locations simultaneously. Many suggest that we need to complete our internal work before we do the rest. The problem is, none of us ever finish our internal work, at least not completely. I know I will be working on that the rest of my life. And since the caste system does not begin with our personal feelings, our personal feelings are incapable, even if we change them, of addressing the roots of the problem. Racist policies and institutions and structures of the caste system. Now, before we go on, we need to acknowledge the terrible impacts of racism and that words are not enough to do so. Human beings were murdered. People were raped. Children separated mercilessly from their families. Lands were taken. Genocide committed. 
abuse of all kinds. All of it within the law, supported by the government, by leaders in business, and by religious leaders. The human toll is uncountable. This system has made some of us at least beneficiaries of such violence, and often accomplices and even perpetrators. But we don't have to live this way any longer. We can all take our part in dismantling the caste system. So when did the caste system as we see it today get its start? Since the beginning of civilization, people in power have created caste systems to benefit themselves. Pharaoh claimed to be the son of the god Re. The gods, then, were said to endorse a system of slavery. Augustus Caesar was promoted as the son of the god Apollo. The gods, then, were said to endorse colonialism. The world was as it was intended to be, and so the system could not be changed. I feel the Abrahamic traditions emerged to challenge that assumption. The 1619 Project marked the beginning of racism when a slave ship went off course and landed at a colony on this continent. They make a powerful case. At the very least, it partly shaped the form that the caste system would take on this continent. I would trace another beginning to modern-day Spain. Large parts of the Iberian Peninsula were ruled by Muslims called the Moors. They supported religious freedom and generally helped to foster a multicultural, multi-religious community for Jewish, Christian, and Muslim residents. Some rulers of Christian areas of Spain wanted to take over the Moors' lands. In 1452, they asked Pope Nicholas V to provide divine blessing for their project. This was the first of what we now call the Doctrines of Discovery. Here's how part of it read. We grant you by these present documents, with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, and subjugate the Saracens, that is, the Muslims, and pagans, and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property and to reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. The doctrines of discovery did not create the policy. The policy came first, as Kendi's analysis would suggest. But it did provide divine blessing or claimed divine will for invasion, enslavement, and theft of property of all those deemed not Christian, including Jews and Muslims. New doctrines of discovery in the next 60 years would bless the policy of European kings to invade, enslave, steal property, and commit genocide in the New World. It is estimated that 95% of indigenous peoples who had stewarded the land for over 10,000 years died within a century after these European kings implemented their policy. You can learn more about the doctrines of discovery in the book Pagans by the Promised Land by Stephen Newcomb. As a result, our nation was formed by two sins of origin, the genocide and theft of land of indigenous peoples and the enslavement of human beings from Africa and their offspring. Thus, the caste system, a system that ranks human beings in importance and value based on skin color was born and shaped every part of our lives today. We have all been shaped by this caste system. It is not only around us, but has been recreated in us so that we don't see it. The caste system based on race is like a computer program that was downloaded into our brains. It was downloaded into our church traditions and other religious traditions when our ancestors came here. It was downloaded into our community groups. It was downloaded into our economic theories. It shapes our very notion of what life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness mean. This is not our fault. 
But the question is this, in the words of Kendi, are we willing to do the work of anti-racism? Are we willing to work to dismantle systems of oppression? Authentic allyship is an important activity for those granted higher status in the caste system. To change the policies that create and maintain the caste system requires people on every level of that unjust system to demand change for justice. Authentic allyship is an important activity for those who experience oppression. Just because we experience oppression does not mean that we understand exactly how others are oppressed. And we must all stand together when the caste system wants to tear us apart and turn us on each other. The work of authentic allyship is led by and centered on those most impacted by the problem. Allies help. Allies support. Allies do our own work. Allies learn the strategies of our leaders. We are needed. We need to show leadership within our own communities and within the halls of power. We must take risks. But we are not the leaders of this movement. Kendi suggests that we must not call people racist, but rather hold people accountable for their support of racist policies and ideas. If racism is about our being, well, then we can't change it. Following Kendi, I would say I don't see myself as an ally. I am not an anti-racist. It is not about my being. But I am committed to doing the work of allyship and anti-racism. The only identity that I want to claim for myself is that I'm a human being. I have been born into a caste system and it falls far short of the world as it could be. And I really mean this as the world really could in reality be. It causes me to fall short of who I am. I feel compelled to do the work of allyship for myself and my community and for the world for greater opportunity, freedom, and human rights for everyone. I feel compelled to do it because my humanity is bound up with my fellow humans. Doing the work of allyship, the work of anti-racism, is important because I do not believe we have to live this way. I am willing to change and to learn so I can take a small part in our mutual healing. The practice of authentic allyship is to do our own small part, dismantling systems of oppression, showing leadership within our own in-groups, and followership of those most impacted by racism. I invite you to continue learning with me.